It is good to see you this morning, and uh, if you have your Bibles, I'd hope that you'd open them with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew, I'm sorry, chapter 6. Matthew, chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 7 and 8 this morning, just a couple of short verses, but I believe really will help us continue focusing on what we've called kingdom habits and the kingdom habit of of prayer and you and I becoming men and women of prayer. So the Word of God says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Let's pray together as we begin to look at these truths. Father, thank you for this truth. Father, help us not to just hear this this morning, but to allow these truths to take deep root in our lives. That we would bear kingdom fruit, kingdom habits that demonstrate and show that we belong to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Can you imagine for a moment that you had a very wealthy uncle? Maybe somebody like Bill Gates or of that nature. Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple. Somebody just extremely wealthy. And this uncle of yours sent you a letter and let you know that you are the sole heir to all of his fortune. You will receive all that he has. He's bequeathing it to you. And you hear this news, let's say, in your 20s. And you're extremely excited to hear this news. I wonder, what would your relationship be like with your uncle who was going to give you all things over the next 30, 40, 50 years? You might just drop everything that you had and move out to California if it was Tim Cook or or out into Washington if it was Bill Gates and just want to be real close to him and get to know him and be a part of all that he was a part of, right? Or what if, on the other hand, you just kind of dropped back a note that said, Hey, thanks, Uncle. Love ya. And then just every once in a while, once a year, maybe around his birthday, you dropped him a card and said, Hey, just wanted to say thanks again. You're the best. It would seem rather disingenuous on our part to have that kind of relationship with someone who is going to give us so much, wouldn't it? Now, now look at the text again, because we see these words again and again in this passage. We see it in verse 5, we see it in verse 7, and when you pray. And I said a couple of weeks ago when we looked at this text, and I'm going to say it again, there's no getting around the fact that people, the people of God, are to be a people of prayer. And let me just tell you something. If you're naming Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, If you've turned from sin to Christ, he's given you more than Uncle Bill or Uncle Tim could ever give. He's given you all things necessary for life and godliness, according to the scriptures. He has saved you from an eternity separated from him and brought you into his everlasting life. Now, shouldn't you and I be people that would be in constant communion with our Father, giving thanks and praise and getting to know and pour into Him so greatly. There's no getting around the fact that you and I are called to be people of prayer. So, this passage says that when we pray, we shouldn't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. They, they think that they're going to be heard for their many words. 
Now, before we get into the application of that, I think there's a real clear picture of this happening in Scripture. Do you remember the story of Elijah when he went to Mount Carmel? If, if you don't quite remember it, turn to 1 Kings for just, just a moment. That's going to be in the Old Testament. So find it in 1 Kings, and we're going to look at chapters 17 and 18 for just a moment. Helps if I know the difference between a one and a two because I was in 2 Kings 17 and that was not going to work for us. So 1 Kings and look at and chapter 17 and 18. In chapter 17, Elijah predicts a drought. And he says before the king, it will not rain in this land until I pray or until God brings the rain. And so this goes on now for three years. Can you imagine how desperate these people must have been who lived? Literally all their vitality was found in the harvest that came each year. And so the first year it might have been okay, but the second year there's worry. Third year, the anxiety level and the stress of having nothing to eat and nothing to sell and no income, it must be overwhelming. And so in the midst of this situation, we find Elijah going to Mount Carmel with a bunch of these prophets of the false god that they were serving, Baal. And as they go up to this mountain, look at verse 20. So Ahab, of chapter 18, sorry. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel, and they gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, Even I, only am I left as a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it to pieces and lay it on the wood and put it to the fire and I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God and I will call upon the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, he is God. Now many of you know this story. Many of you have read it many times. You've seen it in Sunday school lit literature. Some of you, this is brand new. But th this is so good. There are 450 prophets, this false God. And it says that they began to do this early in the morning, and they began to cry out to their God. And about noon, about three hours in, Elijah looks to them, and he begins to kind of mock them and laugh at them, and he says, maybe Baal is asleep. Maybe he just can't hear you. And all the prophets of Baal buy into that. Yeah, let's get louder. And they just become louder. And they literally become cutting themselves, thinking that the shedding of their own blood would somehow cause Baal to hear from heaven. And they go on and on and on. And Elijah continues to just deride them and belittle them and go after them. And it comes time for the evening offering around 6 p.m., friends, these 450 men, these prophets, had been parading themselves, cutting themselves, crying out to God, this false God, as long as they could, with no answer. And so then, in verse 30, then Elijah said to the people, come near to me. And the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar to the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar. Great as would hold two seas of seed. That's about 14 liters. So seven two liters full of seeds, just a big trench. And he put the wood in order, and he cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood, and he said, Fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Now just stop. Do you know how precious water was? 
Three years of drought. This is the most precious commodity that you can find. Four jars full. Pour it on there. Do it again and do it again. And so the third time, and as the water, verse 35, ran around the altar and filled the trench with water. Now remember, for hours, literally all day, these 450 people had been crying out with all that they could to the Lord. And Elijah the prophet came near, this is verse 36, and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. It didn't take hours. It didn't take oblations. It didn't take cutting. It didn't take any kind of great sacrifice. Just a cry from one servant's heart to the Father. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. This illustration from Scripture so very clearly teaches what Jesus has said. You don't have to pray with all these words and long prayers somehow thinking that the longness and the fanciness of your prayers is what's going to get you heard before God. And I know some of you say, well, that's just not a temptation. But I, I want you to realize that the, the prayers of many are empty because they have believed the lie that you must try harder. And, and some of you, even in your prayer life, it's empty because you just walk away from sermons like this thinking, if I just try harder, if I just do more, if I'd spent more time, if I prayed longer, then maybe somehow my prayer life would be full. Do you realize that there are Buddhists all around the world that have wheels that they turn? One of the darkest, most oppressive places I've been was in southern China, and I watched these men and women go in and out of this temple that I stepped foot in, in the presence of of evil was all around and outside they just turned this wheel over and over and over because they believed that if the wheel continued to move, the prayers would continue to go up. Unfortunately, even some of our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters feel that they have to try harder and if the candles, the light when they pray will just somehow cause the prayers to continually go up to heaven or somehow our brothers and sisters of Pentecostal persuasion believe that if they just try hard enough or if they just have the right tongue or private prayer language if they just did enough then somehow the blessing of God would fall on them and that prayers would not be empty but many Baptists have their empty prayers because somehow there's just a little bit of guilt. And so they just go and maybe for a week or two or even a month if they're really hard, they'll just try harder and pray more and say more words. But at the end, if human effort is the motivation to have a rich and meaningful prayer life, you end up empty. And the sad reality is that the prayer life of too many Christians is empty because they stop trying. You walk down that road of the Gentiles for much prayer and much time, and it just felt empty. And so you just, you know, Pastor, I've tried that. I just can't be a man of prayer. I can't be a woman of prayer. I, I just, I can't do this and just stopped. 
crying. And we're going to get to the answer to that in just a moment. But friend, if either one of those describe you this morning, that you've tried so hard and it feels empty or that you just stop trying and there's emptiness in your spiritual walk, in your prayer life, hang on because there's great hope for us. There's vitality and richness that comes out of seasons of prayer if we just look to the Word of God. The reason I believe that far too many Christians have given up on prayer, they stopped trying, is because the quickest way to replicate the quarantine of this spring in the church is to call a prayer meeting. And that may sound harsh. And that may sound mean-spirited. But when we call people to pray, like tonight, we're going to gather on this campus and have the opportunity to pray for the nations and to hear how God is moving among the nations. And typically, when we call people to pray like that, we have the same 10 to 20 that show up. But I'm not going to give up. Because I believe God has called us to be a people of prayer. And I believe that there's power in praying together corporately when we're of one heart and one mind. And so in a couple of weeks, on well, just next week, on August the 9th, our church council is going to be leading out in some of this. We're going to gather here for the next five to six weeks on Sunday nights and we're going to spend focused time in prayer, calling for a concert of prayer and seasons of prayer and asking us to pray in small groups. And yes, we'll do it socially distanced and yes, we'll wear masks if it's appropriate. But I want you to know that the people of God ought to be a people of prayer. And when the pastor or the pastors or the Leadership of the church is sensing and calling and saying, you need to be a people of prayer. I pray that it doesn't end up replicating the quarantine of the spring. That we actually have hearts that are stirred and moved with compassion to pray. And by the way, if you feel that this whole quarantine thing is nothing but a joke and a bunch of sheep that have been led astray, then you ought to be the first ones here to pray. And ask God to do something to wake our nation up if that's what you truly believe. If you truly believe that this pandemic is something that is life-threatening and earth-shattering and could absolutely undo civilization, then you ought to be here praying. But I bet the vast majority of us are somewhere in the middle and this ought to all of us, every last one of us, cause us to say we are a people in need of our Lord. And we are a people in need of reviving. Friends, we don't need to turn on the news every single day to see the same kind of riots taking place in cities all around our nation to have any more motivation for us to say we need to be a people of prayer. So if we've lost confidence in prayer, By saying, I've tried, and and I gave it my best, and there was just nothing but emptiness. Or, I've tried so hard that I'm not even trying anymore. I've just kind of given up on this issue. Look to verse 8. But when, verse 8, sorry. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Friends, our confidence in prayer doesn't reside in us and our ability to somehow go before a holy God. Our confidence in prayer is that we come before a father who loves us. And think about that rich rich uncle that we talked about earlier. So much more than that. Your Father in heaven has looked upon you in your helplessness, 
in your brokenness, in your inability to sustain a meaningful prayer life with him. And he's looked down upon you with great love, love so great that he spared not his only son. You see, your father in heaven knew that there was nothing spiritual in you that could just bring yourself before a holy God and maintain relationship. Your father looked upon you helpless, broken, fallen, and sent his only son Jesus to live a perfect, sinless life. And because Jesus gave that sinless, perfect life on the cross for sinners like you and me, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who looks to Jesus and confesses, I'm a sinner in need of grace, the great exchange takes place. Our brokenness and our sin for his righteousness. And that love that draws us to the cross to see the beauty and the glory of it is the same love that draws us to the throne to come and make our request known before him. The scriptures say that we should approach the throne of grace with boldness, confidence in knowing that there is a father there who not only hears but knows. Did you catch that? Knows our need before we even ask. The reality is that you and I oftentimes don't know what we need. And we just kind of go before the Lord and we say, God, help me. Or we see a need that we think is so important in our lives, but spending time in the throne of God. We see what Psalm 46 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Doesn't mean that you're going to buy the winning lottery ticket. That's what I really want. No, no, it means as we delight ourselves in the Lord, as we find him to be father and the one who fulfills us, he changes the desires of our heart. He gives them to us in ways that fulfill and sustain us. Prayer changes hearts and lives. And most often the heart and the life of the prayer is the one that is changed. As you come before your father who knows what you need before you ask, he changes you. And if there's been a stagnation, if there's been a falling off in your spiritual life, if there seems to be a distance between you and God, might I ask, when was the last time you came before your father who knows what you need? And perhaps you're so distant and so far removed that the only thing you can say is, Lord, I need the joy of your salvation. Restore it to me. David prayed that in Psalm 51. And the Lord hears and the Lord answers and the Lord blesses. It may be that your heart's cry is so overwhelmed, you feel so distant from God because you've just been crying out for the same petition, the same request over and again. Maybe it's a loved one who's far from God, but he's inviting you even in this moment. Come before me. I know what you need. And the truth that I shared a couple of weeks ago is still ever true to this day and forevermore, God still blesses those who pray. See this as an invitation this morning. Your father knows what you need before you even ask. And somebody might say, then why should I even ask? Have you, have you ever experienced Christmas as a child. Can, can you think about that for a moment? Can, can you think about how excited
exciting Christmas day is and you know you've been asking for this certain gift all along you've just been expecting you're hoping that somehow underneath the Christmas tree there's going to be a present that that you've been asking and wanting for for a long time and Christmas morning comes and it's a little bit before dawn but you don't care you go wake up mom and dad and you just got to go see what's under the tree isn't there incredible joy when you open that but have you ever experienced Christmas as a father, a mother, a grandfather, a grandmother, and you know exactly what this child wants. And they've been asking and begging, and you've been saying, Christmas is coming, and, and, and the joy that you have that comes all over you when you're able to give that gift that they've been asking for, that feeling pales in comparison to the Father who knows what you need before you even ask. He is a good, loving Father, and He longs for His children to come and ask what He is able to freely give. And friends, the greatest truth I know is this. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this morning, if you recognize that you're so tired, having tried on your own for so long just to somehow to get God to hear you or answer you, maybe in this moment you recognize that your greatest need is this, forgiveness of your sin and access to your Father. He knows your need. And if you call upon the name of the Lord, even in this moment, He will save you, forgive you of your sin, bring you out of darkness into light. He is glorious. Dear child, this morning, if you're weak and you're burdened and you're overwhelmed, Jesus is one whose yoke is easy and burden is light, and he longs to place that upon you. Come to him with your need. He knows you, he hears, and he's delighted and glorified to fulfill your needs. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for the reminder that our confidence in prayer is not in our ability. Our our confidence in prayer is not found in anything within us. Our confidence is in you, Lord Jesus. Our confidence is in you, God, our Father, who hears and answers according to our deepest needs. And God, we confess in this moment that our deepest need is for spiritual life. And God, I pray that you would restore to us the joy of your salvation. God, even this morning, if there's one just crying out to you for the very first time, that you would grant them indeed the joy of your salvation and beginning. Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you that you're a father who hears and knows and blesses. Glory be to your name. Amen.